All right, we're in Matthew chapter 22, and we're going to begin reading with verse 15. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word, Matthew 22, verse 15 through 22. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle Jesus in his talk. They couldn't tangle him up in his walk. Now they're going to try to tangle him up in his talk. How many of you know that didn't work either? In fact, you, you, you never should ask Jesus a question because he'll turn it back on you. And they sent out unto him the, their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou, art a, that, that thou art true and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man... For thou regardest not the person or of men, that would be, you, you're not prejudiced or partial. Tell us therefore, boy did he tell them therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute that would be money, taxes unto Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he saith unto them, Who is this image and superinscription? And they say unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things which are God's. When they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. I want to draw your attention to verse 19. Show me the money. You may be seated. Show me the money. The Pharisees sent disciples of their proselytes of themselves with the Herodians. Now, I believe the Pharisees sent proselytes of themselves, disciples, because the Pharisees didn't want to mingle with the Herodians. They were enemies. And so the disciples of the Pharisees went with the Herodians, that was those that honored uh, Caesar, those that honored Herod the Great, and Herod the little guy, you know, that thought he was great. And they went to Jesus and said, Master, we know that thou art true and teachest the way of God in truth, neither carest thou for any man. You're not partial. Tell us, therefore... I'm going to preach a whole sermon on that one of these days. Tell us, therefore. Thank you. I will. What thinkest thou? Thank you. I will. And Jesus cut loose on them and said, show me the money. <laughs> now, the Pharisees, they didn't have a problem with taxes as long as it came to their pocket. See, there was what was called a temple tax. There was money that they used for the temple, and it wasn't Roman money. It was the temple tax money. And so they didn't have a problem with taxing God's people. They, taxes wasn't a problem. What they had a problem was is Rome taxing them. And, you know, I understand taxes are necessary, but I don't want them over indulgent with it. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. Taxes are good. I remember when they went, <laughs> I remember when they first came out with bottled water and my dad said, it'll never float. You can't sell water. Now, some of you are holding one now. Hello? And then you thought, you know, Judy and I, our water bill is $100 every month. Judy drinks a lot of water. <laughs> and I take a lot of baths, but I need to. Who would have ever thought that they would charge? And it's not so much, you know, I, I said to the water department one time, I said, why are you charging so much money for water? Isn't water supposed to, free, supposed to be free? And they said, oh, that's not for the water. That's for what it takes to pump it to you. I said, well, I can pump it myself. No, you can't do that. Hello? And then they want to take care of the sewer. Well, what was wrong with the outhouse? 
other than cold and a few loud blowflies, what was wrong with the outhouse? Give me my $100 back. Give me a pot outside under the tree. Now, you know I don't mean that. But the, the, the Pharisees, the disciples of the Pharisees, they didn't have a problem with taxes. They had a problem with the taxes of Rome. And so they went to Jesus, and they're going to trip him up in his words. They're going to try to trip Jesus up in what he says. Now, trust me, I've been tripped up in my words several times, but Jesus never gets tripped up in his words or his walk. And so they go to Jesus with a sure way to tear Jesus down. They sent the Herodians, which were political people that loved the political tax of Rome, and they sent the religious people, the Pharisees, which despised the tax of Rome because they were under Roman occupation. And so they go to Jesus and says, tell us, should we pay taxes to Caesar? Should we pay taxes to Rome? Now, if Jesus would have said, pay your taxes, then probably some of his disciples would be a little bit peeved off too. Are you listening to me? Trust me. I say things that kind of tick some of you off once in a while as well. And so they, they knew that if Jesus took and said, pay your taxes, then they would know that he would divide some of the disciples and some of the people that followed him because they despised being under Roman occupation. Also, the inscription on the coin, which was a Daenerys, which was a silver coin, a little bigger than a, our dime. It was minted out of silver mines by the Caesars. And the inscription on it and the emblem, the, the, the person imprinted was Caesar. And God said right from the get-go, you're not to have anything, any image graven at all. Not of God, not of anybody else. You're not to bow down. And trust me, there's a lot of people that bow down to money. Money makes people bad, 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 bad. Hello? Now, I like money. I mean, in this room, like money. But I don't love money, but I like money because I like money because it puts food on the table. I like money because Judy likes money. But I don't love money. And so they were a little disturbed. So if Jesus would have said, no, don't pay your taxes, then Rome would come down on him and it'd be a bad deal. And, and of course, taxes are good. They're good for fire trucks. They're good for, you know, the, the, the paramedics. They're good for the people that come out and take care. Of it. We saw it in first hand last Sunday. So taxes are good. What's bad is you've got a bunch of freeloaders and covetous and lawbreakers pretending to be lawmakers in high places just getting richer and richer while the poor starve and then they make pretense that's punish the rich but, but so they'll pay their fair share but not a one of them will stand up that's in position and say I'll pay my fair share they're always going around it it's one thing for me to say Chris pay your taxes and it's another thing for me to say James pay yours now, when we do our income tax, Judy always takes care of the income tax, and she reports everything. I mean, if we have two cucumbers on the vine, she reports it to the government. <laughs> she reports every dime. I have books, and sometimes we sell a book, and, you know, I just put the cash in my pocket, and she says, did you sell a book? Because she knows she's going to send a dollar of that to the tax place. So I just quit telling, never mind. But anyway, <laughs> taxes are not a bad thing, but they are bad when it puts people under oppression. And so Jesus said, show me the money. Because if he had said, don't pay taxes to Caesar, then he'd been in trouble with Caesar. It'd been an insurrection, be a problem. And if he had said, uh, uh, pay your taxes, then the disciples and the Pharisees would be really upset. So they thought they had Jesus. They thought, boy, we got him. He's not going to squirm out of this one. 
They complimented on how good he was. You have the truth and you always tell the truth. Trust me, when someone starts complimenting you, wait for the but. Amen? Anytime someone comes into the church and they say, Pastor, I like this and I love this and you're, you're wonderful and I enjoy this and I enjoy that, I'm just waiting for the but. But I don't like this. Well, Jesus says, show me your money. And I, it's, it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. They bring out a Daenerys, a little silver coin with the, inscri with the inscription, the image of Caesar on it. And, and Jesus says, show me your money. And they showed him the money. And he said, whose inscription is on it? Whose image is there? And they said, Caesar. Well, Jesus said, well, if it says Caesar and his picture's on it, Render to Caesar what is Caesar's, and render to God what is God's. Wow, what an answer. What a powerful answer he made to these people that were trying to trip him up. Now, a lot of people will use this passage of Scripture as a means to say, well, you render your taxes to the government, then you pay your taxes to God. That is not what this Scripture is even talking about. There are preachers many times say, well, you know, you render to, to the government your, the, what the government requires, and then you render. And don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm a pastor of church. I believe in tithing. I believe in giving. I believe in taking care of the church. But this is not what he's talking about at all. Render to God what is God's. And what is God's is you belong to God. God made you. He wants you. God created you in his own image, and he wants you to serve him. Render to God that which is God's. It started in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1. The Bible says in verse 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let, us, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air. Some of you need to learn how to handle your dominion stick when you're fishing. And over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In his image, God created he him, male and female, created he them. And God blessed them and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So we know that God made man after his own likeness, after his image. What we fail to see is in the fifth chapter of Genesis, the genealogy, it says that after the fall of Adam and Eve in sin, it says this, verse 1 of Genesis 5, this is the book of the generation of Adam in the day that God created man in the likeness of God made he the, him. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when thou created, they were created. Adam lived 130 or 930 years, no, 130 years, and begat a son of his own likeness after his image called his name Seth. Now it says that Adam had a child at 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image. Not after God's image. Not after God's likeness, but he produced a son after his own image, Adam's image and his likeness. And he called him Seth. And the days of Adam were, had begotten Seth were 800 years, and he begat sons and daughters. How many? I don't know. Probably hundreds and hundreds of sons and daughters. And all the days of Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. So something happened. After God created man in his own image, after his own likeness, something happened that made Adam now produce something that is deteriorated down, spiraled down. Instead of Adam producing a son after the image and likeness of God, he produces a son, an image and likeness of himself. So there's a deterioration taking place because of the fall of man. When God created man, angels were not made in God's image.
plants were not made in the image of God. Animals were not made in the image of God. We were created in the image of God in the beginning. Likeness is a pattern, an image is a look. We lost the look of God when Adam fell in sin in the garden. I, I, want, I want to lay down something here before I really get into the nitty-gritty of the message, but the Bible is very clear in Psalm 1828, for that will light my candle, the Lord is my God, or the, the Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. That's in Psalm 18, verse 28. For thou wilt light my candle. Well, your candle is your spirit. So how do you know that? Proverbs 20, verse 27. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. So the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. And so when Adam and Eve sinned, that light was blown out. Severed from God, Adam and Eve died the moment, spiritually died when they ate of the tree. It took hundreds of years for them to die physically because God made them to live forever. And it took a while for the body to deteriorate after the, after the spirit was blown out, the light was blown out, separated from God at the time of sin. And because Adam and Eve were separated from God, Adam went on to produce children that were second-natured with Adam and not like God. And the children of Adam were born with a spirit unlit. These sons and daughters of Adam were born without the lit spirit of God, for their spirit is God's spirit, but it's dead because in the day that Adam and Eve ate, they died spiritually. And when they produced a child, Adam did, it was after his own image, after his own likeness, because there was a separation and a dismembership from God. Now, when Jesus Christ said, render to Caesar that which is Caesar's, he's going much further than talking about, it's about money, but it's not about money. It's about what belongs to God. And so when Adam and Eve fell, they, were, they died instantly, and they died spiritually instantly, and their light was blown out. And God has to light that candle back. When someone is born again, God lights the spirit, lights them up. Amen. When I got saved, I got lit up. I was in darkness, but God lit me up. When I gave my heart to Jesus Christ, God lit my candle, lit my spirit, because my spirit belonged to God, and God started making me look more like him and less like me when I got saved. And that brings me to my first point. Our spirit looks a lot like God when we get lit up. Our spirit looks a lot like God when we get lit up. Isn't that good? If God, if, you could, if, if you've been born again and Christ has come into your life, if you could see your spirit, God sees your spirit, you've been lit by the Spirit of God, you're born again, you're his child. When God sees your spirit, he says, that's my child. That spirit is in my image after my likeness. Now, how does the body get the image and the likeness? That's through resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's on the way. Until then, we just have to walk around ugly. And the spirit of God gives us a new body when, when we go to the Lord. So what about the soul? Well, the soul looks like and acts like a lot like God when we get born again. See, man is made up of body, soul, and spirit in the likeness of God. And our spirit is dead until we're born again, and our soul is dead until we're born again. 
And Jesus Christ said something about our soul like this. Mark 8, verse 36 and 37. What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And so when God made the body of Adam, the first Adam. By the way, I finished my book. It's about ready to go. And when God made the first body Adam, he was not looking at Adam's body. He was looking at the last Adam's body. He was looking at his son, Jesus. And when we're resurrected from the dead because we're born again Christian, we will look like him. So we get our body in the likeness of Jesus. Our spirit is in the likeness of God and our soul is in the likeness of God. God didn't make the plant life in the image and likeness of him. God did, however, give a soul to the animal. The difference. Plants don't have a soul. Plants just sit Dumb and as dumb as the dirt they're in. Amen? Say, well, they feel better when you water them. Trust me, they're dumb as the dirt they're in. If you'd have walked into this front door and Julie has such beautiful flowers and Chris, God bless his heart, he tries to help Julie, but Chris is a dud. But anyway... In, when it comes to flowers. But Julie does a great job. I'm teasing now, really. Man, we've had 30 years of teasing, ain't we? But anyway, if you'd have walked in those doors and those flowers would have reached up and swatted at you, they give you a high five, glad you're here, you'd turned and went out to your car and went home. Hello? And so plants are not, they don't have a soul, but an animal does. For instance, your dog. Your dog sees you. He's happy to see you. He's faithful to you or she. Loves to eat. You can grab a paper wrapper and touch it, and the dog comes running. I mean, someone can knock on the door, and they don't move. Some of them could break into the house with a bazooka and they wouldn't move. But if you'd reach over for the cookie and rattle the plant, they're there. Animals have feelings. Animals can love. Animals can care for each other. In some degree, animals have a soul. Are you listening to me? Now, a cat <laughs> I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. That would be a song like that, I wonder. Cats cats demand being petted. Dogs lick you and try to get you to pet them, but cats demand it. I walk in the house and here comes Megatron. That's the cat. Gunner named, was it Gunner or Stetson? Gunner named the cat Megatron. Well, we've got Megatron at our house. And Megatron will come in and I don't even like Megatron. But Megatron likes me. And Megatron will come to the table and rub up against me and run up against me. And I just want to kick Megatron, but I'm afraid he might transform into something else. <laughs> so I leave Megatron alone. So in many ways, animals do have feeling. They do have a soul. The Bible says in the Old Testament, the soul of an animal goes downward. They do have a soul. Will there be animals in heaven? Well, we're going to ride back on one. I'm sure there will be some animals in the millennium. The Bible declares it. The only thing that's going to continue to eat dust off the ground is the snake belly. That curse will remain even in the millennium for that. But animals do have somewhat of a soul. But God made you and I the highest of his creation. 
Angels do not have a soul. But you and I do. And God made us after his likeness and his image. Created you and I. And he gave us a soul. And he teaches that the only way to save your soul is to get your spirit lit up. You must be born again. The only way to save your soul, the soul is what loves, the soul is what, you know, the, I used to say the soul is the party animal, the soul is the loving person, the soul is the hate you, I love you, I hate you, I love you. The soul is the emotional. The soul is the woman in every man. <laughs> Wait a minute, let me back up. Let me back up. The soul is the man in every woman. Let me back up. Not working. The soul of you is what loves, what hates, what serves God or refuses to serve God. And the only way to save your soul is to be lit up by the spirit in which was blown out at the Garden of Eden when Adam was uh, sinned and Eve sinned. The, the light vanished. They were separated from God. Their blood was contaminated. Adam and Eve's blood was contaminated. Adam went on to have other sons. Speaking of Seth in Genesis 5, he had son with contaminated blood. And so God had to have some uncontaminated blood. God had to have some holy blood, some uncontaminated blood. So he offers a lamb, a lamb without, without blemish, without a, a fault, a lamb that's pure and holy. Behold, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And so God takes the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, and uses the blood of Jesus Christ to light up the spirit of man so that we once again can look like the image and the likeness of God in our spirit. And then our soul will look and start walking and acting and talking like God. You say, what about my body? What about your body? There ain't no hope for it. There ain't no hope for it without the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The body's going down. I had a friend. I still have a friend. That he said, it's all going to burn. Mike Desiree always said, it's all going to burn. Now, don't misunderstand me. God wants to give you lots of old years. God wants to give you many days. God wants to heal your sick body. God wants to remove cancer. God wants to heal people that are suffering in sickness and disease. Our God is a healing God, and our God is a miracle-working God. But ultimately, we must all sometime or another die in which we can now have a new body that is no longer contaminated by the world and by the genes and by the DNA of our ancestors. We'll be booted and, and blessed and anointed and given a brand new body that looks like Jesus Christ. Now, when God took the tree of life away from Adam and Eve, my wife was proofreading my book, and she said, Is that, should, should it really be saved that he took that tree of life away from Adam and Eve? And I said, yes. So wouldn't it sound better if he took them away from his presence? I said, no. He took the tree of life away from them. And the only way for us to have that tree of life is through the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ brought that tree of life back to us through the cross of Calvary, through the shed blood, and through the blood of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And one day we'll eat actually from the authentic tree of life in heaven to come. Isn't that good? And so Jesus Christ says, render to God that which is God's. So, Jesus says to these Pharisees and the Herodians, Herodians being the political group, the Pharisees being the religious group, Jesus says, show me your money.
And Jesus says, because Caesar's image is on it, give it to Caesar. It belongs to Caesar. Watch this, Caesar's is Caesar's. But render to God what is God's. And you are the image in which God stamped on you and I when God created us. And he created Adam and Eve in his image after his likeness and he stamped his image on us. Now that's been dis- deteriorated and destroyed, but once you're lit up, your spirit will look just like God. Amen? You'll start walking like God, believing like God. Now, you'll never be God, but you'll start being the image and the likeness of God when your soul is regenerated by the Spirit of God. So where Jesus Christ said, show, you, show me your money, I want to say to you, in behalf of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, show your face. Show me your face. Show me your face in the altar. Show me your face in repentance. Show me your face in contrition toward God. Show me your face. Bring yourself to the presence of the Lord. Show me your face. Show me your heart. God is saying, show me your heart. Bring your heart to me. Bring your disappointments to me. Bring your dreams and, and, and joys to me. Bring it all to me. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Show me your heart. Bring your heart to God. Bring your sorrows to God. Bring your sins and your disappointments to God. Bring your love to God. Bring your faith to God. Bring your trust to God. Bring your children to God. Bring your dreams to God. Bring the broken pieces of your life to God. Bring your pain and your suffering and your hurt. Bring it to God. Bring it to God. Because God wants you to show your face. You are made in the image of God Almighty. Let God light you up. Let God redeem your soul. When God looks at your spirit as a born-again Christian, he sees his image. And when God sees you moving about and you're loving him, you're going to church, you're reading the scriptures, you're in love with Jesus Christ, God sees your soul in his likeness. Isn't that good? God stamps heaven upon us. See, those coins were made of silver. But we've been redeemed with things much more precious than silver and gold. From our vain conversation, Peter said. But we have been redeemed and purchased by the spotless shed blood of Jesus Christ and sealed by the Spirit of God. So just like that coin of Caesar's out of silver, and they stamped his image on it. When you get born again, God comes and stamps his image on you. When you give your heart to Christ and you turn to Jesus, God stamps his image on you. And when Caesar stamped the image on the silver Daenerys, that coin, which was a day's labor for a Roman soldier, when, when, when Caesar stamped that image on it, it made that silver valuable. It made it in circulation. It made it powerful. And when you come to Jesus Christ and God lights your spirit and God lights you up and God redeems you and gives you light in your soul, he stamps his image upon you so that you'll be ready and valuable for the circulation of heaven. Isn't that good? Woo, I love that. I love it. I love it. I love it. I'm going to close with this. And I said this uh, last Sunday night, I think it was, because I was going to say it last Sunday morning. And, and well, I'm just going to say it twice. My grandchildren, JoJo, Gunner, Stetson, shouldn't start naming names. Not so much Logan. Logan's an old man now. My grandchildren, Caleb, Sebastian, Riker, Er, Finley, all my grandchildren. There's something amazing about that because I can sit in my recliner at home and I can be as, about as motivated as a toad in a hailstorm. And I'd be laying there in my recliner and I'm having a, and the kids, and I'm watching the kids are playing. The kids are playing with Legos. The kids are, 
The kids are playing. They're having a great time. They're running in and out, slamming the doors, going in and out. And I'm just sitting there relaxing. One of them came up to me one day and said, Papa, get down here on the floor and play with me. I said, you don't know what you ask. Because if I get down there on the floor, I'll never get up. I'll be playing for the rest of my life with you. But those little children, you know, they'll be playing. I watch them. I enjoy watching them. And every now and then my grandchildren will come by and they'll pat me and say, Papa, I love you. Just out of the clear blue, Papa, I love you. Wow. Wow. I mean, it's like Niagara Falls turning loose in my soul. Papa, I love you. What an amazing thing. Any of the grandchildren can do that and just flows through your spirit. I love you. Mama, I love you. Papa, I love you. Grammy, I love you. Grandma, I love you. You know, I don't know what you call yourself. I call you old. But anyway, when the kid says, I love you. And there's something that just sweeps through our heart. I want you to know that God longs for you. In the heat of the summer, and the cold in the winter, in your busy days, whether you're playing or whether you're working, God longs for you to just reach up and say, Father, I love you. I love you. Because they don't say that unless they've been lit by the Spirit of God. We as God's children say, I love you. Because we've been lit. We've been born into the kingdom of God. Show me your face. Come to me, God is saying, and tell me you love me. When you come to church on Sunday morning, you're saying, Father, I love you. When you come to church on Sunday morning, you're saying either, Father, I love you, or Father, I need you really bad right now. And God loves it. God loves it that you feel the need to be here. And God loves it that you feel the desire to call on his name. God loves that. He longs for that. Why? Because he made you originally in his image after his likeness. Created he, him and Adam and Eve, them, and he called them Adam. Show your face. See, you're not ready for heaven until you get stamped with the image of God. Because the image of God has been not erased, but contaminated, overridden, confused, scrambled up. Because there's two stamps on your life if you're not a Christian. There's a stamp of the world, and there's a stamp of God in the stamp of God has been crowded out and defiled. And God wants to clean that all up. and re He wants to stamp his likeness on you. And when he stamps his likeness on you, you're ready to be valuable. In fact, you're so valuable that you've got to go to heaven. You get to go to heaven. You've got to go to heaven and when you get there, you'll be so valuable that the angels will go, ah, oh, ooh, ah, oh, wow. God never did that for me, knowing he's not going to. Angels were made for a purpose. We were made in God's image after his likeness. So God wants to stamp you for circulation. Circulation in heaven. God broke into our service last Sunday morning. Broke in. God, heaven broke in. God broke in. Heaven broke in and took one of our precious, valuable, lively stones home. That's okay. I don't necessarily want him to break in anywhere here, but I'd like for him to break out and take us home. Be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Amen. I'm going to have a hard time recognizing Chris when he looks like Jesus. You say, that's not very nice. 
I meant that to not be very nice. Because we don't want to look like ourselves. We want to be like Jesus. Now, we'll know each other, and we'll have enough resemblances that we'll know each other. But we're going to be in the likeness of God. And right now, as a born-again believer, my spirit, when God looks at it, he sees, the like, he sees my spirit like God, in the likeness and the image of God. When he sees my soul, he sees my soul in the image and likeness of God. When he sees my body, he says, oh, just wait. <laughs> Jesus is coming. And he's going to give us a brand new body. Then it'll be complete. Salvation will be totally complete when we get our new body. Until then, hey, we're going to have to pass by the thrift store once in a while. (laughs) Amen? I got me a new... Well, the kids, I think Judy and Judy, uh, Judy, Judy and Judy, I think, got me, maybe John, got me an electric razor. I never used an electric razor, but I think they got tired of me looking like napkin deals all over my face. <laughs> so they went and got me a razor. And boy, that razor did pretty good. I, I'd use, wet my face and everything. And, and Judy said, you missed the spot. Now I got to get the thing out of <laughs> And then I, I read that you could put some shaving cream on it, and they run better. And so I did. I put shaving cream on it, and it did a great job. Last night, Judy brought some three-in-one oil in. Well, it said to put oil in the shaver, so I did. I got up this morning in the shave. My goodness, that thing ran faster than a doodle bug. I thought I was being eaten up by a weed eater. Man, it went after me. It didn't scar me. It didn't make me bloody. But boy, was I beat up. <laughs> My question to you is this. Have you ever had your spirit lit? You ever been lit up? Have you ever been born again? Because your soul is never going to make heaven your home until you get your spirit lit up. And when your spirit is lit, you're redeemed and born again, and your soul is forever saved. So that when you die, your spirit and soul will go to be with God, and one day the Lord will return and give us all that are Christians a brand new body. Salvation is body, soul, and spirit. Isn't that good? You say, why, why resurrection? If you die and you go to heaven, why have a resurrection of the body? Because God is going to take back everything Adam lost. And he is not going to be satisfied with less than a body for each one of us. Isn't that good? Amen. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank God for shavers and razors. Thank God for being lit by the Spirit of God. Thank God for grandchildren. Amen. You know what they say? Grandchildren is God's reward to you for not killing yours. Josh used to tell me, I, you know, I give the grandkids anything they want, and Josh used to tell me, when we were traveling, Josh would remind me, you would always say, Dad would always say, only the dollar menu. That's it, just a dollar. We don't have enough money, dollar. Everybody got, everybody got water, and everybody got a dollar item. Now the kids can come in, my grandkids, and they can get soda pop, they can get root beer floats, they can get ice cream, they can get the big items. Why? Because they're my grandbabies. My children, you just going to have to live with it. Go to Lowe's and get your ladder and get over it. (laughs) 
And God loves you. And so my question to you would be, are you ready? Because you cannot go to heaven until your spirit's lit. You're going to have to start acting like God, talking like God. You're going to have to start being like God. You're not going to get to heaven unless you become his child. And you can't just hope you go to heaven. You better know you're going to go because God has stamped his approval on your life. Stand with me. I think we ought to have a, 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 I think we ought to have a, a Sunday where we tell all the grandchildren, dollar item. <laughs> Not, that ain't going to happen. Because uncle will buy them something. <laughs> uncle Josh, Uncle Galen. I mean, they'll, they'll blow past me when they come in the house and go straight to Josh. Because <laughs> Josh is fun. What am I, Swiss cheese? Yeah. I am old, but I'm not moldy. I'm old, but I'm not moldy. I want to invite you today. It's still early. I want to invite you today. Make sure. Plants don't have a soul. Plants are just as dumb as the dirt they're sitting in. Animals do have a soul, and it's moved by how they feel and what's going on in their life. But you have a soul that is eternal once you receive Christ. You say, what about my cat? Let's get you straightened out first. What about my dog? Let's get you straightened out first. Let's make sure that we've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Altar's open. Come on, come quickly. You're made in the image of God. He wants to stamp His circulation, His image on you.